So two, two very quick tactical questions, if we could go quickly through them overall, is as investors, you touched on something which I've seen in both extremes, which is pushing entrepreneurs to present to you profitability plans. And obviously, you know this as well as anyone, that, that there's a sort of two sides of the theology. One side is move as fast as you can, get as much as market as you can, and, and the revenue and profitability will take care of itself. I saw here in MENA a venture capitalist ask a startup company for a seven-year cash flow plan, which is obviously the other extreme, which is kind of nonsense. So I, I'm just sort of curious very quickly if each of you could just tell us, when you're sitting down as an investor with an entrepreneur, how do you wrestle this? What advice would you give to folks about thinking about their business plan you know, very, very quickly in this area? You want to start? My advice is don't spend too much time on, uh, on financial modeling because I think, um, uh, I think it was uh, the angel investor, uh, Yossi Vardi, who was saying that uh, if you know what goes into the making of sausages, you would not be eating them. And business plans are the same. So uh, the f if anyone pitches, us, pitches me and shows us like financials, I'll get turned off. Right? Uh, I always ex hope that the entrepreneur shows us his product first. Right? It's all about the product. It's all about the value to users. Uh, you know, when you can nail how you bring value to users, uh, it's not hard to then hire an MBA to tell you how to make money or figure out how to make money. Right? So. so it's different. I have to go a little bit in a different direction. In the MENA region, it's different because the investment community is not developed. Okay? There is no availability of funds, of dry powder, of money floating around that takes you from C to early stage to Series A to mezzanine to IPO and exits and liquidity. There is no such a thing. As much as the market is evolving in terms of the startup, the market is evolving in terms of investment and in terms of investors. So why is it important to, to look at it from a long-term point of view? It's not because you want to uh, 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 push the, the startups to reach profitability is because there is a lack of a full system of investment, right? A startup could get the actual money, could get 500000 on early stage, but they might be hard-pressed to find somebody to give them a million and a half to keep them going 18 months from now. So if you haven't thought about what are your, your uh, cash needs, what are you, what's, your, what your, what's your need for capital over the next three years, you might be, have a fantastic start and then hit the wall because nobody is going to give you the money because you haven't thought about it. So cash flow and over the long term is important because the market at the investment level is not mature enough. James? I agree it's important to um, have an eye on the financials and, and keep the money in, uh, zeroed in because you always want to lengthen the burn rate and have as much longevity in the, in the game as possible, right? Uh, but one other way to look at it, instead of focusing purely on just the financials or purely on a product, is to imagine what the end state is for you to raise your next round, right? If you're trying to do it as a venture game. Uh, the, the best way to do this is to envision what the next stage of investors would love to see, right? And it could be some sort of margins, some sort of sales data, some sort of tractability that would attract the attention of the next round of investors and work towards that, right? Uh, and uh, so that you don't lose focus of the money, but you also don't lose focus of just the product and the users entirely. So that's one middle ground. So one more kind of quick tactical, then I'll have a wrap, and I'd like to go to Google, though we have one gentleman in the audience I'm going to call on as well in a second as well. Talk a little bit quickly, if you could, about investor relationships with their companies. One of the shocking things to me when I came here is what I'll call term sheet abuse. I, I see these wonderful entrepreneurs with great ideas, and their investors have convinced them they have to give up 80% of their company. And it's, you know, from my perspective, it's just foreign. I don't understand why they, they think of themselves as, as lords as opposed to partners and all. And Did I'm you say 80%? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's just terrible kinds of things. And so talk a little bit about what are the... What's the ideal relationship with an investor and how an investor is really going to help that entrepreneur to win from the companies and experiences that you've had? I mean, for us, we're looking for founder-led businesses. You know, we're not interested in businesses where um, some kind of nebulous angel investor um, who sits in the shadow owns 60% of the shares because he put in $10,000 at the beginning or $100,000 or even $500,000. Uh, we typically, I mean, we always pass on those opportunities. Those are of absolutely no interest to us. Uh, or if we're interested in the opportunity, we'll just say, look, we need to rebalance this because this doesn't make sense. You know, there's somebody here who doesn't have much value and has way too much of the shares in the business. Um, you know, we, we do it kind of 
uh, I guess the way it's done in mostly in, in the US, I guess, where you know, typically when we invest at seed stage, let's say we put in half a million dollars to a million dollars to maybe up to a million and a half, um, we'll seek to get between 20 and 30% of the equity. Um, for us, the rule of thumb is very simple. Every investment we make needs to have the potential to return the whole fund. It's as simple as that. Our fund is $30 million in size. So let's say we take 20% of a business. We need to be able to believe that that 20% could be worth $30 million at some point. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, so that, that's how we work. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, okay. And the, the terms are always more or less the same. Uh, James? Yeah, so we, we invest at a much earlier stage when often the founder could just be three or two guys. Uh, and we also then invest a little bit up to the Palmyra's stage, right? Uh, 50 to 500K range. And uh, we, we have taken things like minority, you know, single digit percent interest when we co-invest alongside other lead investors in markets that we don't ha we're not very strong in. Uh, but we've also then gone up to the 20, 30% type of scale for seed stage investments. But I, I, I believe that you know, this world is big enough. There are all kinds of investors for all kinds of entrepreneurs and businesses, right? Uh, for the games that we look for, the founder-led businesses where we are swinging for the fences, where every single investment needs to return the fund. Uh, you know, yes, we want the entrepreneur to lead the way and we're really there to support uh, their journey and, and to you know chip in and help make it happen uh, the, Someone has asked previously during yesterday's panel about how investors really help right what value we bring to entrepreneurs and and this sort of um, value is inherent in the conversation even before we talk about the term sheet right you have to feel that the investor knows what he's doing can give you perspectives that you don't have by yourself uh, and won't be a pain in the neck for you when you're managing the board. Uh, and, and all these aspects need to come together to make you have the chemistry to ha be in a good relationship with your, with your investor. Um, yeah, we, we usually take minority stake. We don't like to take majority, especially in early stage. It's usually very depressing for the entrepreneur to walk in, give him or her $500,000 and take the company over because we don't want to run the company. We don't want to participate in a day-to-day. -day. We want to work at the strategic level. So, the, and, and the market in the Middle East here, in the MENA region, is at the point where you have to roll up your sleeves as an investor and, and, and be the partner of, the, of the, the, the founding team and just make things happen. You have to work with them on a daily basis. You have to make things happen. You have to understand their business. You have to understand their issues and obstacles, and you have to just open the doors for them. Otherwise, we're not, unfortunately, at the stage where we can sit back and enjoy the investment. Yeah. We're not there yet, maybe a few years from now. So very quickly as a wrap, and then I'm going to turn uh, uh, to Nabil in a second, then we'll turn it up to Google overall. But Habib framed this conversation as where is the money. I had an entrepreneur here yesterday say to me, oh, Chris, there's plenty of money. The good news is there's plenty of money here in the Middle East. The bad news is it's in you guys' pockets. What is it going to take to open up your pockets and start making some serious commitments, do you think, in the region? If you could name sort of one thing that becomes a tipping point quickly, we'll bang through it. And I'll start with you, Elek, since you're here. Well, you know, we're, we're deploying as fast as we can. You know, with Wamda and Habib and a few others, things are happening. Um, you know, the, the, the way the market happens is that we need a big pipeline. We need to see a lot of deals to decide on which one we want to bet on, right? And we are at the market where we're starting to see that groundswell in terms of entrepreneurs, companies coming over, and, and requesting for the money. So we're starting to, to see that it's going to take time. And, you know, we're, we're definitely the money is not for us to keep. It's, we want to deploy it. So, you know, if I walk away from, from this conference here with some money deployed, I'll be more than happy. That's my job. Okay. Yeah, so uh, as an outsider, right, what I look for beyond uh, getting to know the entrepreneurs better and uh, over time seeing execution and implementation is also getting to know the investors better, right? Because we're not able to lead rounds in the market and region that we don't, we can't add value immediately. We're good at, uh, you know, the US, rest of the world, Asia, Pacific type of stuff. But uh, so getting to really know the investors, enjoying working together with the investors and entrepreneurs, that, that's what it will take for us to unlock the money. Partnerships and all. Palmer? I think, I mean, the, the key to enable more investments is to see also more success stories and exits. Because e exits is, um, are, are the thing that make the whole ecosystem work. Because exits create money for founders and for investors. means that investors can make more investments. Makes, it means that founders can start doing angel investing. 
And um, and even you know in the European ecos ecosystem where I come from, there's a lack of exits. You know, it's an ecosystem that doesn't really work that well, frankly speaking. So um, uh, you know, so exits are key, and uh, that's. You know, it's interesting. I was just talking to one of my former board members who made the exact same point that not only is exits critical to investors, but it's critical to the ecosystem and to the entrepreneurs because success breeds success. And I think this is absolutely going to be a, a, a great indicator of what's happening. Before we turn to Google, I just wanted to introduce you all to a, not a new player in the, in the world of MENA, but is actually doing some really interesting things in early stage here, uh, Nabil Yusuf. Um, has now just started a fun early stage called Ajal Capital, and I would love to get a couple of reflections from you as well. 